available upstairs for £10. And uh, uh, I hope you very, very much hope that you enjoy it. I, sh I should begin with a few thank yous. Thank you to the team here at Resolution Foundation, because this book, 10 years on from the first edition, contains lots of new evidence and material, and that is much of it uh, assembled by the work that we have been doing here at Resolution Foundation. And all the Resolution Foundation researchers who have contributed to it are properly acknowledged in the book. Thank you all very much indeed for coming along, and in particular thank you to Zanny Minton Beddoes, editor of The Economist, who's going to interrogate me in a moment before the rest of you also get to interrogate me about the book and the arguments in it. But I should just give you a brief resume of the argument and the key evidence, because I'm afraid in a way the bad news is that the argument in the book that the boomers are doing well and the younger generation aren't doing so well, the argument stands and the evidence is even more compelling. We've got 10 years more evidence from when I first produced it. In fact, someone said to me that the, he thought the book was supposed to be a warning, not a training manual. Uh, so we have got uh, a lot of new evidence, which makes the case even more powerfully. This is the key demographic chart. It's the only chart which appeared in the original edition. And one of the many comments I got back afterwards was we needed more data, more evidence. And look at Resolution Foundation, we do charts. So there's going to be a few charts in this presentation and more in the book. This is the, this is the key one, which just sets the scene because this tells you the story of the different size of different generations. And, and it shows the twin peaks of the British baby boom when we had more than a million babies born in 1947-8 and in 1964. Uh, you can have sophisticated demographic analysis. You can also observe it was after two very cold winters uh, that we achieved those heights. Uh, I defi There's no, of course, fixed official definition of what constitutes the different generations, but I define the boomers as the people born between 1945 and 1965. And then you've got Gen X with this plummeting number of births going right down to a low point in 1977 after a long, hot summer. Uh, and then you've got the millennials, which I, who I define as basically born between 1980 and 2000. And the, in a way, the key argument in the book is that is, is, a, is a challenge to reverse the conventional view, which makes a lot of sense intuitively, which was, if you were given a choice whether you'd rather be born in a small cohort or a big cohort, which would you choose? And the classic argument from Malthus onwards amongst the demographers, well, it's obvious, choose to be in a small cohort. Less competition in the jobs market, less competition in the housing market. You know, you would travel through life, business class, not economy class. That was the... That was the approach that people took. My argument is that rather unexpectedly, it's turning out that being born in a big cohort works to your advantage. And the argument is that's partly because you sh in a market economy, you shape, you're a very powerful group of consumers who shape, uh, who shape markets around your preferences and wants. It's why the Rolling Stones are still on tour and why a revamped Mini still sells strongly. So we are a very powerful force in the market. Uh, and in a democracy, we are a very powerful voting group. We've got political power as well. So a big cohort can have market power and political power, and we shouldn't be surprised, therefore, if things work out rather around the interests of that cohort. So that's the key argument in the book. And here's that is the demographic framework for it. Let me now give you just briefly some of the evidence about what's been happening. First of all, on incomes, uh, then on assets, then on the welfare state. We'll start with this kind of income chart. And the convent when I started working in public policy and social policy an awful long time ago, it was just assumed that being old equals being poor and that measures that were targeted on older people were, without even having to get involved in means testing, were also going to be well targeted on poverty. 
And this chart tells you that almost the year when the first edition came out was the year when Britain went through a historic turning point when the income after housing costs of a typical pensioner household caught up with the income after housing costs of a typical working age family. Uh, and uh, they've, since then, they've moved pretty much similarly. But you've now, you can see in 2010, working age and pensioners, pensioners caught up. And because some people worry about what was happening at the bottom and the top end, you can see, if anything, for the poorest pensioners, for the pensioners at the 20th percentile, their incomes are rather higher than the poorest working age families. So there's an income story where older people have caught up and on some measures exceeded the incomes of the working age population. Um, there's an asset story as well. And the two most important assets we build up in our working lives are first of all our house and secondly our pension. Um, and this tells a story of home ownership amongst young people reaching a peak of 50% back in 1989 and then falling to half that rate. And total home ownership has now started to fall, but has fallen much more slowly. So this is also telling us something important about the changing composition of home ownership. Older people more likely to be homeowners, younger people less likely to be homeowners. That means, of course, many young people renting instead. Uh, and if you really get into the detail, as we were able to on the here at Resolution Foundation, it means that the space occupied by a young person, their living space, is shrinking relative to the living space occupied by an older person. So it's not just a financial thing, it affects the quality of life. Uh, as I said, housing is one form of wealth. The other crucial form of wealth is the pension. And these aggregate figures for total wealth put together the two main sources uh, so that you can see how much the boomers have got, about 60% of all wealth uh, they've got a lot of the housing wealth, but they've also got very substantial pension wealth. And I should just explain what this is about. So if you have a promise to pay you an income above a certain fixed chronological age, we will pay you uh, X thousand pounds a year above the age of 65, and life expectancy then increases, that promise is worth more. So if you've got a defined benefit pension scheme con con uh, constructed around a promise like that, your wealth rises as life expectancy rises. If you've got a different sort of pension, if you've got a defined contribution pension, if you've got a specific pot of money and life expectancy rises, then increases in life expectancy just mean a lower annual income because the pot is no bigger. The boomers have got the final salary pensions which increase in value as life expectancy rises. The younger generation have got defined contribution pensions, which don't. So there's a, there's, a, there's a very significant wealth gap, much bigger than you would expect just from the usual life cycle effect of older people building up their assets. And then finally, there's the distributional impact of the welfare state. So I've told you about incomes, I've told you about assets. What does government do? And this tells us that we are entering a period when as we boomers grow older, even without any actual increase in our individual life expectancy, just because the lot of us and we grow older, we will push up spending on pensions and on healthcare. Uh, the two main features of the modern welfare state, we, we produced a report on the changing shape of the state here only yesterday that brought this out very clearly. We have got a, compared with other advanced OECD countries, our state has a rather unusual shape. It is particularly focused on healthcare and pensions. It's a particularly focused on the services that we boomers, as we get older, particularly care about. And these forecasts, admittedly rather heroic, but these forecasts are trying to keep policy stable. We're not assuming any new policy initiatives, increasing the generosity of the promise. We're just feeding in some classic forecasts about what's going to happen to, the, to pension incomes and to NHS costs, and adding to that the demographic effect of a large number of boomers. And this tells us that it's going to drive up spending on the welfare state. And it's very hard to see how that can be done without taxes rising as well. 
So we're about to enter an election campaign where people may avoid that. I personally think that the Conservative Manifesto of 2017, however controversial and difficult, actually was a realistic manifesto. It recognised that the days when you can promise tax cuts have gone, with these type of upward pressures on spending, we're instead moving to an environment where taxes are going to have to rise. This is a, a specific chart, and uh, Laura Gardner, who's here, who is our head of research and worked a lot on this um, whole project, uh, prepared this slide. And um, this is another set of heroic assumptions, but we try to work out uh, for a picture, for a stable picture of taxes and the welfare state, how much over their lives generations will put in or take out. Because thinking back to my time as a constituency MP, I used to have people come to me saying, look, I'm entitled to all this. I've paid for it. I have contributed. And this tries to calculate exactly how much different generations have uh, contributed. And you will see that the peak age when people will have contributed uh, the least relative to the value of what they take out when you are ahead net by £291,000 is for those middle period baby boomers born in about 1956, which just happens to be the year that I was born. <laughs> so looking back on over 30 years in uh, public policy, hoping that I was doing high-minded things in social policy and tax and public expansion, the different things I've worked on, I realise I've ended up with a welfare state perfectly targeted on my age group. Uh, so for, uh, you would expect in a growing economy, it's OK if, if people take out a bit more than they put in. That's what a growing economy uh, can afford. But you can see a particular cohort that has done exceptionally well from the welfare state. So uh, let me just sort of bring this to a conclusion by saying behind the stories of income and assets, there's, a, there's the practicalities of consumption. And again, if you look at what is happening to consumer spending by different age groups, you can see this surge amongst uh, uh, over 65s, a composition effect because of the arrival of the boomers in that, in that group. And you can see how particularly badly the 18 to 29 year olds are doing. And so to the 18 to 29 year olds in the audience this evening, I'd just like personally to apologize and say, we're all gonna to try to do better in the future. Um, let me end with what I think are the crucial, there's the crucial challenge for the future. Uh, and this I think in some ways is the most important slide after that first one of the setting the demographic framework. This tells us about what in, you could argue is the most important change in British political economy in a generation. If you look at that line in the right hand axis, this is telling you about the ratio of wealth to income. And this says through that the 70s and into the early 80s, our total wealth was about three times our national income but that we've been on a steady upward trend since the 80s, where wealth has now risen to about seven times national income. And if you think about it, a society where wealth has increased so much to income has changed its character in a really profound way. The point at which we feel it, the point when the rubber hits the road, is when someone is trying to build up a deposit to buy a house by saving out of their earnings. That's when that move from income to assets has proved to be so painful, so difficult. But, uh, I mean, think of what's happening to equality and inequality. Some people say income inequality is rising. It's not, actually. Income inequality has been fairly flat for about 30 years. And you could even, just to keep the example very simple, accept that asset inequality, let's just assume away any changes in asset inequality. Assets tend to be more unevenly distributed than incomes, but let's assume that asset inequality has not increased either. Nevertheless, a society where assets have become much more significant relative to incomes would feel like a society that had become more unequal and more unfair, even though it didn't show up in either the income statistics or the asset distribution statistics. And that, I think, is what is happening. This is a society where inheritance matters more 
and where what you can earn matters less in determining where you can get to in life and what you will own. That is a crucial challenge. And meanwhile, the amount that's collected in taxes on capital has not increased at all. And this is not just an economic analysis. This is a political analysis which is very relevant for the environment of the coming election. So what has happened, as we've seen an increasing age divide in income and wealth and uh, in the services of the welfare state, you can see it in voting behaviour as well. Class is no longer a significant determinant of voting behaviour. Compare 2017 and 1974, you know, there's no real difference between Labour and Conservative support on the basis of social class. Instead, it's by age. And instead, we've got an aged gap opening up in voting behaviour, with the Conservative Party now heading for 60% of the votes of the, of the 70 year olds. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, it's support amongst uh, younger people declining. And it is just a reminder that back in the 1980s, look, conservative support amongst younger voters was above 40%. It is not written in tablets of stone that a conservative appeal always has to be to uh, older voters. It's possible to have a different political appeal, but this gap has opened up in the last 20 years. And I think it's something that has to be tackled by both political parties. Because I do not wish to see generational conflict oldsters versus youngsters. I'm not trying to promote generational warfare. I'm trying to warn about unfairness between the generations, which is different than trying to promote conflict between the generations. I actually think that one of the things that holds a society together is the contract between the generations. Now, the book is also an attempt to explain the social contract as an intergenerational contract. Um, and that is what Burke put so poetically, so beautifully, uh, in his essay, he thought of society as a contract between the generations, a partnership not only between those who are living, between those who are living, those who are dead and those who are to be born. And when we look at the way in which the debate on, say, uh, the environment and climate change is going, it's a reminder that we have obligations, including to people who do not yet exist which we have to discharge. So I think it's an appeal to a principle that holds us together, not trying to foment conflict to drive us apart. Thank you very much indeed. So, Zani, now it is over to you to interview me and then we'll hear from the audience. Excellent, well, thank you. Um, you, don't, uh, you, know, you don't hide what you're arguing under a bushel. <coughs> how the baby boomers took their children's future and why they should give it back. So in the spirit of that, um, I guess my first question is, are you selling this at a discount rate to the young people here? <laughs> We've got a discount rate for everybody of uh, £10 tonight, Karen. I think Karen. That, would be, um, no, that would be appropriate. Uh, no, I, look, I think it's a really interesting book. You, uh, the first version was very interesting. The second and updated version is extremely interesting. Uh, my first question is really about how you prioritize between the different dimensions of the intergenerational challenge you're talking about and kind of one dimension is i guess that of you know flat incomes and consumption crunch amongst the young relative to the old another is home ownership or lack thereof a third is sort of broader wealth concentration mm. because of what's happened to asset prices broadly and and the fourth might be what you call risk transfer in the book so because of the shift to defined contribution pensions, there's much more risk for younger people. Yeah. Kind of put them in some order for me. What are you worried right. most about? Right. Yeah, that's a, that's a very fair question. I think the top of my list is that income asset shift. I do think it's a, it's a very different society where wealth is... The aim of acquiring wealth through your earnings looks like a distant prospect compared with acquiring wealth by inheriting it from someone who's already got wealth. So yes, I think that is the biggest single change in a society. And uh, look, I don't hate wealth. I don't, I don't, don't think people who are rich should be penalised for being rich. But I do think when you look at those welfare state spending figures, this is why I am reluctantly drawn to the conclusion that faced with the challenge of funding that increase in welfare state spending, by taxing the earnings of people, of, uh, of younger people, 
versus trying in some ways to access the, uh, get a contribution from people who are themselves sitting on very valuable property. I think it's right to expect the older generation sitting on their capital to make a contribution. So I think that's the biggest issue of the law. So it's the redistribution part. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't, as I said, I would just see it as when over time, over the next 10 years, even if politicians try to avoid it, we're going to face a debate about how we fund this increasing cost of the welfare state. And we know instinctively what happens. You put up income tax or you put up indirect taxes like VAT. The two occasions when my party has come back into office on both occasions in 79 and 2010, we did decide we had to raise taxes. And on both occasions, it was VAT. I don't think a third time round it could be VAT. And uh, instead you get stuck into what you can do on capital taxes. A good place to start is the council tax, which is a really badly designed tax, but is actually by far our biggest capital tax uh, and is shockingly regressive. So even the capital taxes we've got are not well designed. I doubt you'd find anybody who would disagree mm. with that here. So let's mm. sort of take that as given mm. council tax needs reform. Um, it would, you know, much, much overdue. What about, if, if assume that's the biggest challenge, and I think you're probably right. How big does the shift in the structure of taxation need to be? Do we need to think a bit more radically, you know? Do we need to think about wealth taxes broadly? You know, that's what's happening on the other side of the Atlantic. Do we need much bolder inheritance tax reform? I mean, you, you mentioned mm. that in the book. Talk me mm. through what, what your ideal tax system looks like yeah. to address this. Well, I think inheritance tax is another classic bad tax in that it's at a very high rate, but starting above a very high threshold. A uh, surprisingly small number of households are actually going to end up paying inheritance tax, 5 or 6%, but a lot of people are worried about it. And 40% sounds scary. So you can do, uh, you can imagine a kind of two stages of reform. One simpler thing to do is to bring back lower rates of inheritance tax and to spread it at above a lower threshold. And you could end up, the, role, the more radical reform is to do some kind of receipts tax, bequests tax, so that the tax is borne by the recipient above a certain amount which would actually reward people for breaking up estates rather than concentrating them. So those are the those are the kind of things, and I, I don't I go into these in the book partly because the challenge last time was so what would you do? I don't claim this is the last word on capital taxes. It is an attempt to start a conversation about capital tax reform, and even in my own party, talking privately to some of my uh, friends in the House of Commons, they can see that cap if faced with the alternatives of taxing younger people more, some sort of capital tax reform is needed. Well, that was going to be my next question, given that your party is overwhelmingly the mm. party of older people. Um, uh, how are you going to get this uh, put forward? I don't see much sign, publicly at least, of yeah. anybody jumping on this bandwagon. Well, one, when you follow the argument in the book, you can understand why I, ha I had to retreat from elective office to the safety of the House of Lords. <laughs> uh, so yes, it is tricky. But look, I think that the the argument is, I think it is a winnable argument, and the, the most encouraging evidence is housing. Uh, and it was housing that got me into this way back, the beginning of the millennium. It was, it was, it was the experience of, of doing a constituency surgery when some young guy working as a nurse and his partner who was working at Tesco's would come to see me because there was no way they could find a place to live sometimes, let alone buy a flat. And then I'd go to a residence association meeting that evening full of decent people in their 50s and 60s who were governors of the local school, all trying to do the right thing. And they were protesting about any housing development in their area. And, but I knew and I would say to them, hang on, I know where you're living. Your, your houses were built in the 1970s. The previous generation built houses for you when you were young. They accepted their fields had to be built in to house us, our generation, don't we have a similar obligation for the younger generation? So some of these arguments were first developed when I was, because in democratic politics, you're not a kamikaze pilot. I was trying to think of arguments that would actually win people over. And if you look at the polling on the question, do you think more houses need to be built in your area? The answer has gone from about 25% agreeing to over 50% agreeing. So I think you can appeal to people's instincts that they want to help their kids and grandkids. And I think for me, the conservative argument as well is, you know, the property-only democracy is a, is a 
familiar Tory slogan, but it's gone into reverse. We want to spread ownership rather than see it retreat. But it's one thing to say, do you want more houses built for your children? It's another one to say, um, are you prepared to see a higher inheritance tax rate? And indeed, would you be prepared to pay inheritance tax? And that doesn't seem to be going anywhere in your party. Well, I think that the council tax is a winnable argument where you can start. If you do it, if you design it very carefully and you say, look, it will be a ch- some of these charges can be charges on your estate and you can make it easier for local authorities to borrow against future tax. You can do things like that. Um, I think on inheritance tax, if we were to uh, win that argument and we haven't won it yet, I would do, a, I think the way to win it is a version of the Gordon Brown penny on income tax. In other words, to say, look, this is to pay for social care or the NHS. In other words, it's to pay for something that is mainly of benefit to the over 60s. And if, I, I put, and you know, we've, de- we've debated here, including in the Intergenerational Commission, how we would fund social care. There is an argument uh, that it should all just be social insurance paid for out of tax. We're worried that if you went down that route, it would end up being a tax on the younger generation. But insofar as social care requires more public funding, then again, if that's the kind of tax, if if older people are being asked to pay a tax to deliver that sort of service for them, and you say, look, this is for you. Do you really think your kids should pay for it? Or don't you think you should contribute in some ways out of the assets you've got? Again, it's an argument worth having, and it is not impossible. We're trying to broaden the range of the politically possible. And what do you think of the arguments that are being made by the party which the plurality of younger people do support, um, and what direction that would take us in, and would it help? Well, I think that both parties are are not really levelling with people at the moment. I mean, my party may be promising tax cuts when I don't think they can really be afforded. Um, Labour are saying you can fund their massive programme, including some things which I really don't, when we've got so much on our plate, I don't think are are necessary, entirely out of taxes on the top four or five percent or something, they say. And what I regret has disappeared from the Labour conversation, the way Labour put their case, is a kind of proper Clement Attlee case for the welfare state, saying we're all in this, we want to see more spending on the welfare state, and it is a national community effort, and all of us who can afford it should chip in. It can't just be funded by taxing some billionaires. Um, so I don't think either party is coming out of it very well at the moment. And, and you know, thinking back to the, to the 1980s, of course we made mistakes then, but actually there was an element of kind of stern Methodism in Mrs. T. In Mrs. T in the early days thought you actually had to raise, if you, she very much had a completely different view from Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan was the sunny optimist. He thought you could borrow the money and it'd all be fine. Plus, uh, she was much more shocked by budget deficits and thought you, it was sometimes necessary to raise taxes in order to bring them down. And I think that's, that's part of what's necessary now. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open up to questions and just, yeah, actually, why not do it now, right now? Go ahead. Mm. Hi. Um, I know we've got a roving, I think we've got a roving mic. Yeah, uh, a roving yeah. mic and just Why don't you just introduce you. yourself oh. quickly, too? Just wait for them. The mic's coming. It's just coming. All right. Thank you. Is it working? Hello? Yeah. 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 Great. Thank you. My name is Nusheen Agar. Um, very interesting. Thank you. Um, the other side of the equilibrium is the cost of living. Yep. Cost of living is constantly going up. Transport cost and the rest of it. <coughs> Food, rest of it. So um, the incomes are squeezing. So how is this helping the old generations? And is, is part of it your party's uh, policies? Just, should we take a couple of questions mm-hmm. and give you a sense? Thank you. And there was a yeah, lady here in the second row. Hi. It's interesting you talked about the housing market because the the growth of wealth is largely based on housing prices. So do you think there's any reason to control the housing market because we talk about affordable property but people can't afford them? Should and Basically, we don't have a housing crisis in London. There are enough houses there for people to live in, but it, who, who has access to those houses? That is the problem. And we allow anyone to buy to invest their money in council property, in property. Should we do what Switzerland does, for instance, and only enable people to buy property if they're going to live in it or work in the area, rather than whoever wants to? Because private property is 
empty. They keep building all these flats mm. in London and nobody mm. lives in them. Mm. Thank you. So cost of living and how yeah. you address those in the world. Yeah, I think, I mean, the, the, the big drive in the cost of living is the cost of housing. And again, uh, you can see it's, it's where the younger generation are particularly hit because when they're not owning, they're renting, privately renting and paying quite a lot. And one of the drivers of the improving living standards of the older generation is many of them are only occupiers with the mortgage paid off. So there's a, housing is the biggest single driver. Transport to some extent, and again, it looks as if the amount of, the distance that younger people have to commute to work has increased. And that, well, let me put it precisely, the time they spend commuting has gone up significantly. Um, so, because again, and the reason I get into all this is there's so many meetings and events I do on this where boomers basically say, well, young people, they're not working very hard or they haven't saved enough. Uh, those costs for them are higher. On housing, I understand what you say. When I cycle home to West London and past uh, the, the, the flats of, alongside Hyde Park and the candy development, there's, almost, there's rarely any lights on. And it is indeed a depressing sight in central London. So many of these buildings are, are black and you would kind of expect there to be lights on and then not to be darkened. And the, and even, you know, even if it's not the party you're invited to, just you expect to see people going in and the tinkling sound of wine glasses being poured and you don't get that. It's dead. It's parts of central London are dead. Um, now, my residual, my surviving free market liberal instincts mean that I am very reluctant to get into rules about who can own properties. I do think that they are undertaxed. And the evidence is that, uh, and council tax is the main culprit, but not the only one. They are grotesquely undertaxed so that you can, the, uh, we should at least be collecting more revenues from them. And so much revenues that it starts to become rational for them to be occupied. Yes. Gentlemen at the back. Uh, David, thank you very much for the talk. I really like the point about assets relative to income is now greater, meaning that we feel more unequal, even though neither Gini coefficient has increased, because I think that's the key point here and nobody else has really said that as clearly. Then I had two quick questions. So first, was have you considered environmental degradation? Because that really yeah. seems to be another way in yeah. which the boomers have kind of yeah. like tilted the economy. And then second, like if the boomers have benefited so much because they've voted for the economic rules of the game, which suit them best, how do we counter this narrative that we, like we've paid for this and we deserve it, we've sweated, you know? How do we tell them yeah. actually no, it was a form of corruption where you kind of voted for the economy which suited yeah. you best and took away all the advantages that everybody else could face. Yeah. Um, well, on the assets stuff, and thank you for what you said on that. Um, yeah, the natural assets. Of course, Dieter Helm has done some work on natural capital. And you could imagine, if you're being visionary, a kind of proper set of national accounts that include um, environmental costs and the, and the value of natural capital and the loss of its value. Um, I don't really get out into that in the book. I'd have a brief dis discussion of kind of climate change and its environmental uh, and its impact across the generations and cite a wonderful figure I was giving to mentioning to Zanny earlier that the, the, the if you imagine if you set if you say that we're going to get down to only global temperatures rising by 1.5 degrees the IPCC measure and you then work out how much carbon dioxide emissions have to be reduced over time to achieve that by 2050, you find that the amount of carbon dioxide that the younger generation can produce during their lives is one eighth of the carbon dioxide that boomers will have produced during their lives. That is the scale of the climate change adjustment that has to be borne by the younger generation. So all these arguments, in some ways, actually the most sophisticated kind of ethical debate about rights of future generations and claims of future generations is, is being generated out of the environmental movement. Um, on, the, on the kind of pa I've paid in argument, the reason for this ready reckoner, the chart I showed in which the 1956 birth cohort have done best of all, which is page 178 of the book, is I was thinking of my 
friends, former colleagues in the House of Commons, when someone comes to their surgery and says, that they used to say to me, but Mr. Willits, I've paid in, I've, uh, I'm entitled to this. And I was kind of thinking, you would say, so, yes, when were you born? Ah, you were born in 1946. Well, on, on my calculations, you've actually paid in 930,000. <laughs> Uh, but you're going to take out 1,162,000. So it hasn't worked that badly for you, have you? So if we are going to collect another £1,000 a year of council tax from you, it's, you're still let ahead, you know. With, you know. So that's why they ready reckon that. That's why I wanted to put it in, so that, um, so that politicians could deploy it if they wished. You could have it. I mean, you can imagine having it on the wall of your constituency surgery when the conversation... Sort of when, laminated. Yes, exactly. We should, I might do that, actually. That's a good idea. Send it round to the, <laughs> to the new MPs. Questions. Hello, Mark Essex, KPMG. Um, I really like the book. I read it in 2010. I'm looking forward to getting this one. Um, you've answered my shout, uh, throwing things at the telly bit when people say I've paid in all my life and the answer is insufficient to cover the cost of it. Um, and my question is, on the capital gains tax and the property taxes, that's clearly the answer. I've got a little book of pitches that I give to politicians at Tory conference and elsewhere. And that one where I pitch charging capital gains on primary property, but scrapping inheritance tax, which is a double taxation on post-tax income, is a no-brainer, it seems to me. It's the one where everyone laughs at me and says, that's impossible. And I think it's impossible because the baby boomers won't vote for it. How do we fix this? Well, I mean, first of all, and Zanny who's pressed me on this, yours is another, it would be another option. And whether you did first home or prime residence, I know that's tricky, but you, at the moment, CGT is extinguished on death. So you could just say that the estate had a CGT liability. Yeah. So you, can, you could do it that way. As to whether this is, this is winnable, well, of course, at the moment it looks tricky, but think down the track. Um, the, the pressures for increased spending, look at the way in which the debate revolves around the NHS. Um, and if we're going to have any fiscal rules, it's very hard to see how the long-term cost of the NHS can be funded without taxes going up. Uh, and then it does become a debate about which taxes and the, the kids, um, whether the kids will be willing to pay for it. And gradually over time, as the boomers get older, there will be more and more younger voters coming along. And there'll be people in their 30s, 40s, 50s who still don't own their own home or finding life tough. So I'm trying to get ahead of the curve before we have um, real anger amongst the young, younger generation and old people find that there's just not the willingness to pay for the services that they want to receive. But do you think we can get there without going through a period of la-la land of, you know, the billionaires can pay for all of this, or we don't have to pay for it, we can just run up large deficits for a while? I mean, do we have to, can we kind of, it sounds as though you're going to get your ready reckoner and, you know, start convincing your constituent, or your, if it were you still never your constituents, but, or do we have to sort of go, go in a somewhat, you know, imprudent direction for a while first? Well, um, I think we are, I mean, depending on how you measure the tipping point, we can see the ex increases in the spending coming on. Um, I don't, although I think we should have a proper debate about capital taxes, we have got time. You don't have to do one sudden massive increase. You could start by some uh, uh, uprating of council tax. You could imagine adding some bans at the top end. There are, you could start by saying pensioners who are working should pay national insurance on their earnings. Um, you could, you could do a, you could gradually increase the age at which oil, older people get their free travel card in London and increase the age at which younger people get a free travel card in parallel. So you don't need to do one mega thing. You could, you could imagine how you could start this happening. And I have to say that, I mean, one of the things I regret is the way the, the TV license debate is being handled. So you don't, you don't need a mega massive tax increase if you are willing to do a few things a step at a time and, I, and start winning the argument. So um, I think it would, and you know, freezing allowances, uh, you know, saying you could do a partial on capital gains tax, you could say that some of the liability wasn't extinguished on debt. I can, I can see if you think of the well, kind of internal can. treasury conversations, I can see ways where you get started on this.
Um, yes, lady in the second row. Very interesting talk. I was wondering if you had actually disaggregated the figures by gender as well, because I have a sneaking suspicion that if one take, takes a look at the female cohort, then those ratios may look a little different. And I, I am aware that you probably had people in your surgeries who were women saying, hey, wait a minute. So I'd be very interested to know what those figures look like yeah. for women. You can do some gender now. Not all of this data can all, at the same time be breaking down by gender. You can do some. And I have to say, about the only group of protesters who have actually gathered outside the building with their flags and their protests were the WASPy women who said the increase in the pension age uh, was too rapid, uh, it was unfair, unacceptable. Um, the gender story is a bit complex because for younger people, the reason why I, I'm, I mustn't make this, I picked you know, the key statistics, but it is not a totally bleak story. And one of the good things that's happened, one of the things you could argue, is for younger generation, gender discrimination is much reduced compared with what it was. So the good news is that women in their 20s earn now as much on average as men do in their 20s. The big hit still happens, however, when you get into your early 30s and start having babies. And that does seem to knock, a, uh, sadly, too many women off their kind of earnings trajectory. So the re actually, I think one critique of the book, you could say, is that the, uh, the world uh, the world may have got a bit, may have got more better for women than for men. And some of the, you can't get into all the asset de detail in detail by gender as well, but I, th I think you could argue the female narrative is a bit better than the male narrative. There was a question here at the front. Yeah. And coming up, coming up, don't worry. <laughs> don't worry, we've got, we've got time. We'll get to all of them. Hi, thanks, David. Um, I'm glad you mentioned free bus passes. I learned today that the government spends about $1.2 billion on free bus passes and has invested $40 million this year. Dollars or pounds? Dollars or well, pounds. I, I, I'm working in dollars because they invest $40 million this year into autonomous vehicles, um, which feels like an incredible right. balance of priorities. Um, but my point was more, obviously, there's, there's a huge um, crunch coming. Do you feel and do you think you can explore in the book more any areas where it's not a zero-sum game between transfer of wealth? So, for example, reforms of pension rules which allow pensioners to invest into new and innovative technologies, yeah. changing the way private social care may work to improve outcomes yeah. uh, for both employees and, and employer. Yeah, that is a really good point. And uh, as you know, one of the things the Treasury are interested in is some liberalisation of the rules on pensions to make it easier for them to, uh, pension funds to invest in um, unquoted assets. I mean, the Neil Woodford saga may have set that battle back, but that, that's going on. Uh, and there are, and you could argue for the private rented sector, one thing which needs to be promoted is organised high quality build to rent development. And the kind of mom and pop scenario uh, is not always the best arrangement for for youngsters, so but the pension funds being put in, the pension funds being put into building high-quality private rented accommodation uh, is another opportunity. Is another option. Yes, yeah, so there are things you can do. Where you can see the money being put back in to way, in ways that help the younger generation. And when you look into it, it's surprising how the regulations make this quite tricky to do some of it. Unnecessarily difficult. Lydia, second row. Thank you. Uh, Marianne Seacart, Chair of the Social Market Foundation. Mm. I wonder whether a lot of this could be solved by having less differential voter turnout. I mean, it seems extraordinary to me that both main parties, despite that fascinating graph on age, uh, still want to keep the triple lock on pensions. Both main parties say they want free TV licenses for over 75s. Why? Because older people turn out and vote and younger people don't. I mean, why aren't younger people angry yeah. about this? Why aren't they yeah. voting more? If they voted yeah. more, the political parties would pay more attention to them. Yeah, uh, and it is in, and the figures are that for every one voter of a certain age in their 50s and 60s, there's another 530,000 voters. And for every young person voting in any one year age group, there's another 400,000 voters. 
So there is a gap. Um, the reasons for it, again, and what I sometimes get, you didn't, you didn't put it this way, but I sometimes get, you know, well, these young people, they're so lazy, they can't even be bothered to vote, so this is what they've got coming for them. When we looked at it uh, in a paper that I think Laura Gardner, who's here, uh, wrote vote, with a brilliant title, Voting McVote Face, <laughs> what we found was that the biggest single factor was being in the private rented sector. And part of what had gone on, and registering to vote is harder if you're in the private rented sector and moving around. Only about two thirds of people in the private rented sector are actually on the voting register. And as younger people have increasingly gone into the private rented sector, that seems to have, let's use it explicitly in American term, suppressed their voting participation. So, um, one thing we could we should do is make it easier for people in the private rented sector to register to vote uh, then there's separately the arguments about voting age well i've certainly come around to the view we should have voting age from 16. we had david runciman the cambridge professor of politics here uh, discussing this subject with us the other week david proposed that the voting age should be reduced to six he thought you should have your first experience of voting when you were at primary school. I, I like the sort of the, wild, the wilder option that you should have the same number of votes as there are citizens and parents should have a vote on behalf of their children, which is another way of doing it. David had an objection to that, which is he didn't like some people having more voting power than others. Uh, so that, that's why he came up with his alternative solution. But there are, there, so there are wilder, there, there are sort of increasingly wild options, but certainly 16, and I don't think 16 would necessarily be the end of the, end of the process, because, yeah, absolutely, we should, we should, you could imagine, you, you certainly, if you just did the two basics of lowering the voting age to 16 and making it easier to register when you're in private rented accommodation, that would be an important start. There was, yes, gentlemen, three, three back. And then over there, yeah, right, right here, yeah. Yep, yes, you. Um, hello, um, I'm, I'm David Goodhart. Uh, where, where do I work? I work at Policy, Policy Exchange. <laughs> um, I was also born in 1956. <sighs> But I feel less oh, guilty about it than you, I think. And I'm also in denial about it because I haven't yet claimed my free bus pass. Um, but there, there seems to be a rather kind of fundamental thing you're missing out here is that Gen X and the millennials are our children and they're going to benefit from our assets. It's, it's, going, to, it's going to trickle down and sort of work its way out. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, assuming we have some affection for our children. Um, uh, also, a few rather basic yeah. things that, I mean, you're, you're very welfare state focused in your analysis, uh, but you could have forget the fact that average incomes are now a lot higher than they were when we were young. Um, uh, you know, the kids, we weren't brought up with the internet. Uh, we didn't have uh, iPhones. We didn't have uh, EasyJet. Um, and also, half of us didn't go to university. You seem to think the universities are wonderful institutions. <laughs> I, I have doubts about that. Um, but, you know, and, and the kids are only paying for half of their bloody tuition fees. The rest of us are paying for the other half. Right. Um, I was waiting for that perspective. Yes, and David, yes, thank you. when David and I are not debating the pinch, we're debating my other book, A University Education. Uh, look, two comments on that. First of all, of course the wheels of modern business capitalism continue to turn. Of course there are new products and new technologies. And that is an advantage for the younger generation compared to the older generation. However, the wheels did not start turning in 1970. We had, I can still remember, the first TV arriving in our household. So I was brought up with access to TV from when I was relatively young, when my parents were not. And before that, there was the radio. In other words, every generation, certainly since the middle of the 19th century, has been able to access from childhood a technology that had only arrived during the lives of their parents. So that process of itself doesn't end the, uh, doesn't sort of solve the problem. Uh, it's just part of the backdrop. And indeed, actually, when we dig into consumption, one of the interesting things is spending on online services and everything, if anything, is greater amongst the boomers than amongst the, the kids. The other point on inheritance, and this does get to the heart of, I think, a really acute dilemma, is um, that inherit in the scenario where this where wealth rises relative to income, inheritance does matter more. And part of the paradox, and this might even be sh you know shared ground between us, David, is 
The modernists used to think that one feature of the modern world would be that the family would matter less. The family was a traditional institution which would, whose significance would reduce. If anything, what has happened in an age which is more, in a period which is more age segregated, and you have smaller families, the family has changed its nature. You have fewer brothers and sisters and siblings of the same age you're much more likely to have a surviving grandparent, possibly a great-grandparent. So the family has become the kind of bamboo, uh, that pole that links the generations. The family is less horizontal than it was. So we're, uh, we're a horizontally segregated society with the crucial vertical connection being the family, more important than it used to be. And that in turn means that absolutely that um, in, that's why social mobility is increasingly an issue. The, the vertical transfer of opportunity within the family is more important. Now, this is not a bad human instinct. It's good that we want to help our kids. Uh, the book is dedicated to uh, Imogen and Matthew, our two kids, both of whom happen to be in the audience, so I'd be very careful what I say. But the, uh, so there is, in, inherit, you do look after your own kids, but there comes a point when we also want our children to be in a society that is meritocratic and mobile. We don't really want them to be brought up in a caste society where inheritance is the way to wealth. Uh, and anyway, as we boomers are living for quite a while, the median age of inheritance is 61, so they have got quite a long wait. So inheritance is not the... Is, is not the proper solution to this challenge. But isn't there also the fact that since the boomers, since life expectancy is rising, the boomers are going to be living substantially longer and thus the financing of the social care and health and all of the other things attendant is going to be under our current tax system paid for by a cohort of workers who are going to have to be paying relatively more if we don't change the tax system that funds it. So that hence yeah. the focus on the welfare state yep. and, and tax. So one is the sort of sustainability of the current financing model, which is sort of separate to what you think about the redistribution yeah. between the generations. Yeah. But, um, but we have, yeah. have boomers of all social classes, you know, you know, working class boomers who also own their property, you know, have assets that they can pass on to yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, housing, but yeah, but I'd turn that around the other way. House, home ownership was for a time the most widespread form of uh, asset ownership, but it is, it is now shrinking, and the, um, that is part of the problem. It's, uh, it's much less widely spread than it was. Lady at the back there, yep. Um, I'm your wife. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right. This is going to be interesting. I don't know how many resolution events I've done sitting here. That's the first time <laughs> we've had an opening like that. Thank goodness. <laughs> no. um, beloved, I was living in Palo Alto in the late 70s and early 80s, and I was electrified to hear Mrs. Thatcher, and I wasn't a conservative, talk about wealth creation, enterprise zones, enterprise allowances. Where's that now? Oh. Um, well, Good the question. Yeah, the, the, the answer is that the, uh, it's, got much, it's got harder for people to create wealth. And the environment we're describing is one in which wealth is more likely to be inherited. But... Uh, and we're in, and this is what the resolution exists to study, really. If the, since the crash in the last decade, uh, we haven't had the increases in living standards, we, and we haven't had the in increases in GDP. The economy has been chugging along at a very slow rate, so it is not a growth environment. And that is, all these issues would be much easier to solve if just the economy were growing properly. Yeah, I and mean, it's not been. Um, there are lots of questions here. Yep, gentlemen, there are three rows back. Hi, um, it's a great talk. Um, I work in the NHS, and um, it strikes me that people are starting to live a long time. I look after children, and some of them are going to be living, the healthy ones, to 110, 120, I think. So I'm just wondering, maybe, maybe you're being... You're, setting yourself short. I mean, do we need to be more alarmist about this? I mean, are we going to be hitting a tsunami of older and older people who are going to cost a lot of money to look after? And we need to think very creatively in ways in which we're going to do this. Well, the, um, 
That first peak of the baby boom, the people born in 1947, um, the vast majority of them have made it to the age of 70. So 20, 2017 was the year of the 70th birthday card on a scale that had not been seen before. And I mean, it's good news. I mean, we mustn't, we mustn't be perverse about this. So many of them are living for longer and in better health. There is a lively debate about whether these improvements in life expectancy are extra years of ill health or of good health. I'm towards the optimistic scale of that. I think quite a lot of it is good health. Um, but what they have got the advantage of, that cohort, those early boomers, they had a lot of entitlements that were fixed by chronological age. And so if you have an entitlement from the age of 65, that might have been fixed when the assumption was people live to 68, but you're actually going to live the way you tried. Those, all those promises are worth a hell of a sight more. Now, we are by and large working out now that we should index them. So there's indexing of the pension age. Thank heavens, we've now got into that. Um, but there was a lucky generation for whom all these promises have ended up being worth far more than was ever forecast because they are collecting benefits fixed by an entitlement from a chronological age, not by a sort of set in terms of life expectancy. Yeah, so there is a once-off cohort that will be very expensive for a long time. Uh, but I hope, as I say, they can give back. Again, I don't want to just be bleak about this. One of the good things is it looks as if they're devoting quite a lot of time to their grandchildren. Being a grandparent is not just a matter of this inheritance of wealth. Um, grandparents are massive givers of childcare. There's even a theory, well, more than a theory, there's even an account as part of the explanation for childhood obesity is grandparents are such softies when it comes to giving the kids sweets. So the increased amount of time that children are spending with grandparents seems to be associated with um, all the sweets being given. Them. So, but there is, a, there is increased engagement. I see that's the paradox of all this. Individually, as within families, there's more of this exchange. We are better parents than we are citizens. It's, the question is how much of this can be done within the family and at what point does it have such perverse effects that we need to do much more on a, on a, on a basis of citizenship, not just family. And so I was wondering if we could formalise it a bit more, change the way in which we think, work much longer, yep. maybe much more in a voluntary way, maybe a national service for people that yep. are retired, something similar. But create those kind of ideas so we're not spending 45 years drinking Costa coffee because that's impossible yeah you know? yeah you know, so and uh, yeah and there is this there are there are these attempts to create intergenerational exchange and it's you you look at the policy and when you're trying to turn it into a hard-edged white hole policy it's trickier but but you know lots of ideas including you know nurseries and old people's homes being co-located those tv programs we love watching those tv programs you know, the channel 4 series when you know the the old people in the homes loved having visits from the kids and the kids start being socialized outside the family by meeting the old people. It's all that. And, you, and when you try to dig into it, you do find there are some areas where policy planning commission rules, social services assumptions about different ages being threats to each other, so they have to be heavily regulated. There are things you can do to promote intergenerational connections beyond the family. Yes, second row here. Yep. Don Drake, uh, I can look forward to reading your book, having spent um, too many of my sad, year, my sad life um, working on things like inheritance tax, capital gains tax, council tax reform. The um, point I would like to just pitch into the debate is the difference that there is now compared with the baby boom years of ordinary um, families. Today, um, many of these families are locked into means-tested benefits. Um, work that I've been doing quite recently shows that for them, their marginal tax rate is 18 90% and will be under universal credit. Um, I've looked to see what fig the figures are, and I don't have reliable figures. I've asked the Resolution Foundation for their help, but they haven't come up with anything. But I think it's like one in four of all working families are going to f face nowadays a marginal tax rate of 80%. Mm. If that is the case, you cannot do much to improve your living. Mm. And that is a, seems to me a sea change 
from the time when I was a parent, um, let alone the time when you were parents. Mm. And I should say, Don was a career uh, official in the Inland Revenue for many years, and indeed I can remember the briefs you used to write on in taxes and this. Um, uh, there is, I mean, there are, there are indeed increasing claims on means-tested benefits as a result of the interaction of partly low pay, also the spread of private renting. And it is the case that the welfare state was based on a series of assumptions. One was old people are poor, and another was most of us end up as owner-occupiers. A world in which, as we now have, and I, I give the figures in the book, we've now got um, 3.6 million families with children in, in owner home occupiers still, but half that, we're now up to 1.8 million families raising their kids in the private rented sector. <coughs> And the housing benefit bills for the private rented sector, i do not not familiar with exactly with your calculations, I suspect are one of the reasons for these high marginal rates and the large numbers of families on. So you're right, and it's, it's actually a very good prudential argument to use with the Treasury and others as to why promoting owner occupation makes sense. A society where most people are private tenants and claiming housing benefit is incredibly expensive in the long run. Which that actually, I'm just going to well, get lost in a second. That gets back to, I guess, where we started this conversation, which is which are the, what is the priority of all of the many things you've laid out? Because if, if the focus is housing, then you, you address that element. If it is, you know, stagnant pay and low pay, then it's really a productivity and a growth question. Mm. And if it's this, you know, where assets are right, right now, then it's a redistribution question. Yeah. And the, I mean, we at Resolution do a lot on pay and low pay, and you're right, it is um, about productivity, it's about access to skills and training, it's some practical points about being close to um, good employers paying higher wages. But the, I do think the assets are a place to start. And we have got, as I said, and on the assets, the reason why I'm not a total pessimist, for the two key assets, for both of them, there's a bit of good news. So for housing, there clearly is a shift in attitudes to more house building. On pensions, and we haven't touched on this yet, uh, the good news there is that although the pension is a, is a DC pension, you're, take, you're much more of a risk bearer, nevertheless, auto-enrolment is one of the conspicuous cross-party public policy successes. So we've now got 10 million people, many of them younger people, who at least through auto-enrolment putting some money into a personal pension pot. And what I think is that can be used as the core of a programme for spreading asset ownership. You could imagine a government that, and indeed it could be with an age rule, you could say for the under 30s or the under 40s, we're going to make a one-off exchequer contribution into your pot. You could imagine moving to a situation where you expected you had a higher level of exchequer contribution alongside um, employer contribution. You could also imagine liberalising the rules so that you could, it was easier to borrow against that for your housing deposit. The £10,000 per 30-year-olds that we produced in the Intergenerational Commission report, um, affectionately known in the trade as the bung for the young, the, the, it was really about trying to give them a start on the an asset ownership and the obvious place to put the 10 k is into these auto-enrolled pots. So I can actually see quite an interesting agenda where you do reverse the decline of property ownership and help young people get started with that deposit to buy a house. And I can remember um, one interview, I think it was Sky News or something, somebody interviewing me said, well, 10,000 pounds, 10,000 pounds is nothing. The shocking evidence is that 10,000 pounds more than doubles the wealth of two thirds of 30 year olds. If only 10,000 pounds was a trivial amount to them, but it's not. So there are things you could do like that. And I think that is quite an interesting policy. I can see, once you get into this, I can see some of it. So that's being, the one that you'd put financed by inheritance tax reform? Yeah, that would be, uh, that and help for social care, yeah. Don't question that, yeah. Um, just going back to the discussion about types of ca uh, capital taxes, what's your view of land value taxes, which I know The Economist is a big fan of? <laughs> The, I mean, there are arguments for land value tax, and you know, I maybe you know, I associate it with the Lib Dems, and it goes right back to Lloyd George, doesn't it? So it's a, it's a sort of Lib Dem talisman. It preceded the Lib Dems by quite a long way. Yeah. It preceded the Lib yeah. Dems by yeah. quite a long way. Yeah. 
Um, I wouldn't read that. As I say, I'm not... I do get into capital taxes more in this edition than in the previous edition. Exactly how you do it, I would, I would not rule that out because clearly in the UK there have been some extraordinary surges in land values driven by kind of agglomeration effects and it's right that uh, you look at some way of capturing that. Whether you can measure it, I mean one of the issues trying to think of the inland revenue papers that went around and all this, it's quite hard to measure but I wouldn't rule it out but we certainly need some and if I were trying to reform capital taxes, I would probably not go for one big bank solution. I would actually try to have a package where I did a bit on council tax and I did a bit on inheritance tax. Uh, maybe we could do some version of, uh, of what you're proposing as well. I'll take that. Um, questions, anyone in here? We're exhausted. Yeah. Get one more there. Yeah, and then people want to get upstairs and start <laughs> buying the book, don't they, Karen? Yeah. At the discount rate. <laughs> At the discounted well, price. I, thank you. I'll, I'll double dip. Right. Um, helping people buy. I'm always stuck right. about that. Let's give the youngsters 10 grand. They can then leverage that up 10 times on a 90% mortgage. And then effectively, through um, that getting into the house price system, write a cheque for £100,000 to an existing homeowner. Doesn't that rather go against everything that we're trying to achieve? Well, this was endlessly discussion. We had it in the coalition, whether you do the demand side or the supply side. And um, on this, I'm not a purist. I do think that uh, they go together. You clearly need increased supply of housing. Um, but also, if you target it on one subset of purchasers, you can help them relative to other purchasers. So I wouldn't completely rule out helping on the demand side as well. Um, but getting more houses built and helping younger people get started, I think, complement each other. I think we'll leave it there. David, thank you. Um, it's a great book. It's uh, 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 the, particularly the new policy ideas at the end. Um, pragmatic, uh, as you heard, um, sensible, if only they were implemented. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Sandy. Thank you. Thanks.